Our gospel reading this morning comes from the gospel according to Matthew in the sixth chapter. We'll be reading verses 16 through 18. Our reading this morning continues where we left off last week. We are in the midst of the Sermon on the Mount. So let us attend to God's word for us this morning. Jesus said, When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father, who is unseen. And your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. This is the word of the Lord. you please pray with me? Lord our God, use the words I speak this morning that they might contain your word. Use our ears that we might hear what you speak. And then use our hearts and our minds that we might take it out into the world to be a blessing to others. As we pray in Christ's name, Amen. So here we are in the second week of Lent. You can tell it's Lent because there's purple all over. You can tell it's Lent because of the sackcloth and ashes in the middle of the sanctuary. During this Lent, we're looking at what it means to live a, a disciplined life that is a life of a disciple, and how we can practice spiritual disciplines that we might grow in our discipleship. Last week we talked about prayer, and today we're talking about fasting. You know, prayer is one of those, those disciplines that's a, an internal, spiritual, mental discipline. But fasting is a, well, it's a very physical discipline thing. We might wonder why, if it's a spiritual discipline, why do we practice something so physical? Years ago, I began studying martial arts and hadn't been doing it very long when one, one day as we're training, our teacher said to us, you know why we do this? And of course, as we're sitting there sweating and panting and aching, saying, oh, well, no, Sensei, why, why do we do this? <laughs> and he says, you know, you, you can't take your mind out and have it do push-ups. You can't take your spirit and have it do sit-ups. We have to work on our spirits indirectly. And we do it by working through the body using the body as a vehicle to work on the spirit. You see, the people who who develop these martial arts recognize something that we in the West often forget, and that is that the mind and the body, or the spirit and the body, are intricately connected. The Hebrews recognized this. They knew that, that The body and the spirit were not separate things with the spirit contained in some shell as though the body didn't really matter. Indeed, the importance of the resurrection is that we will have bodies. Body and spirit are are intricately connected. And by practicing a physical discipline, we can discipline the spirit as well. But why something like fasting? Fasting is such an an old-fashioned kind of discipline. Once heard somebody quip that, you know, we Presbyterians, we've we've given up fasting for potlucks. (laughs) And yet, just as Jesus said with prayer, he also says with fasting here. He doesn't say, if you fast, but when you fast. The expectation is that this is something we, as disciples, will do. And so the question remains, why? Why fasting? 
You know, John Calvin, that reformer in Geneva from whom our, our reformed tradition takes much of its, its thought, much of its shape. John Calvin said there were three reasons why we should fast. He said the first is that fasting is a way of, of humbling ourselves and showing remorse. Okay. Coming before God in uh, acknowledging our need for him and that we've messed up. <clears throat> and in particular, he said this is something to do as a, as a group. Okay. You may remember the story of Jonah, where Jonah goes to Nineveh eventually after messing up a bit along the way, but he finally gets to Nineveh, and Jonah goes into Nineveh and proclaims 40 days, and Nineveh will be no more. Okay. And the king of Nineveh proclaims a fast. He has everyone dress in, in sackcloth and, and put ashes on their head and eat nothing as a sign of their remorse, as a sign of their humiliation before God. But it's not just a biblical thing. In fact, we in America have done this before. Back in, in uh, 1863, President Abraham Lincoln declared a day of fasting and prayer. He designated April 30th to be a day of national humiliation fasting and prayer. And he proclaimed it with these words. He said, It is the duty of nations as well as of men who owe their dependence upon the overruling power of God to confess their sins and transgressions in humble sorrow, yet with assured hope that genuine repentance will lead to mercy and pardon, and to recognize the, the sublime truth announced in the Holy Scriptures and proven by history that those nations only are blessed whose God is the Lord. The awful calamity of civil war, which now desolates the land, may be but a punishment inflicted upon us for our presumptuous sins. To the needful end of our national reformation as a whole people, intoxicated with unbroken success, we have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace, too proud to pray to the God that made us. We have grown in numbers, wealth, and power as no nation has grown, but we have forgotten God. Could those words not apply today? Fasting as a, as a sign of humiliation, of repentance, fasting as a, as a reminder that we have become intoxicated with our self-sufficiency. I don't think we're going to be holding a national fast anytime soon. But fasting as a reminder to ourselves how much we rely on our self-sufficiency. Fasting as a way of humbling ourselves before God. That's one purpose of fasting. But Calvin said not only is that a, a practice for fasting, but, but fasting also accompanies prayer. When Jesus was out in the wilderness after being baptized, the Spirit led him into the wilderness, and for 40 days he fasted. And he prayed. And that time of, of prayer and fasting strengthened him for the temptations to come. Fasting and prayer go together. In the book of Acts, we read about how the church in Antioch, they fasted and they prayed and then heard the Holy Spirit tell them to set aside Paul and Barnabas to lay hands on them and commission them to go out and preach the word of God to the nations. Fasting and prayer go together. And that's not accidental. It's related to that interconnection between body and spirit. You know, when we fast, changes happen within our, our body. 
When you're not eating, your body is, is burning up fuel still. It mostly is using glycogen. It's like a, a kind of starch-like material that our livers store. And after it's burned up, this glycogen converted that glycogen to, to sugar. Yeah. It needs other fuel. Yeah. And our brains need, need a simple sugar, glucose, in order to function. Yeah. Our brains can't burn anything else directly. They need this, this material. Right? And so the body switches gears and begins to take fat and protein and to convert it into sugar to convert it into glucose. I used to get to teach this every semester in, in biochemistry. But the thing about it is that not only is this a, a change that allows our brains to keep functioning, okay, but that change away from, from burning the normal fuels okay, results in physiological changes, and those physiological changes result in a, a change of our mental state. Something happens when we fast so that we're more attuned to God. And when you fast and pray together, there's this, this ability to discern and to hear God's voice that is different than when we pray on a full stomach. Fasting as an aid to prayer is the second reason why we can fast. But Calvin goes on and talks about a third reason. Yeah. He talks about the, what he calls the, the mortification of the flesh. Right? Isn't that a great phrase, mortification of the flesh? Right? Oh. It's an old phrase, and it doesn't refer so much as pun to this idea of punishing the body. It's not self-flagellation. Yeah. Mortification of the flesh has to do with getting fleshly desires under control. Fasting is a discipline in which we learn to discipline our body so that we're disciplining our appetites yeah. rather than, than eating whenever we're hungry, rather than eating whenever we're sad, whenever we're bored, whenever we're not having anything else to do while watching TV. Yeah. It's taking a physical appetite and reining that in, putting it under control so that we are learning to discipline our spirit, learning to discipline our will. And it doesn't happen easily. Andy Crouch, he talks about the, the challenge there. And he talks about spiritual disciplines in general. He says, you know, anybody can do them. Okay. You know, anybody can fast, anybody can, can pray, anybody can do the other things we're going to talk about. But doing them well is another story. He says, you know, take fasting and food. He says, there I can offer a personal testimony to the humbling effects of the disciplines. He writes, my annual fast during the seasons of Advent and Lent are darkly comical reminders of how completely undisciplined I truly am in my relationship with food. No matter how minimal the fast I set out to practice, one Lent it was simply leaving milk out of my tea. I find that I almost never am able to keep it to the end. He goes on and says, among the most pitiful moments of my life was that day about two weeks into Lent when I desperately and furtively opened the refrigerator fully aware that I was breaking the most minimal fast conceivable, but feeling completely unable to go on without milk in my tea. It was the sweetest and the bitterest cup of tea I ever had. He says, when we practice the spiritual disciplines, we discover how deep runs our commitment to our own autonomy and comfort and how addicted we are to the approval of others, the sound of our own voice, and the satisfaction of our appetites. Fasting helps us learn to discipline our appetites, not our appetite for food, but our appetite for those things which are not of God for those things that don't help us be disciples. It is as we learn to discipline those appetites that we can do as Isaiah writes about, that we can have a fast that isn't focused on us, but turns our attention to helping others, 
to feeding the hungry and clothing the naked, housing the homeless, comforting the sorrowing. Because in the end, fasting is not about us. Fasting is about becoming people who God can use. You know, as we practice these spiritual disciplines, we, we encounter God in new ways, ways that change us. And it may seem that, that we're trying to, to force God's hand by doing so. I want to leave you with this, this thought from a book by Philip Yancey, where he talks about a rabbi that he had heard about. He said, the rabbi taught that experiences of God can never be planned or achieved, even with fasting. Experiences of God can never be planned or achieved. The rabbi said, they are spontaneous moments of grace, almost accidental. His student asked, well, rabbi, if God realization is just accidental, why do we work so hard doing all these spiritual practices? The rabbi replied, to be as accident-prone as possible. You'll find in your bulletin an insert with a description of of fasting, a way of trying fasting sometime this week. That fast can be from food, but but for many, that's a challenge for physical or, or medical reasons. You can fast from other things as well, from the internet, from the television, from speaking, from caffeine, God forbid. Um, There are all kinds of ways to fast, ways that remind us of who we are before God, of how richly we are blessed, and our call to be serving others as we give up things we don't really need that much. So this week, let us practice being accident-prone. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.